And friends, it is so perfect timing because as we get closer to the end of this world, as we get closer to Jesus coming, the devil is going, there is going to be more deception. There is going to be more counterfeits that the devil does. And so we, I, I, my concern is that we do not get deceived by false manifestations as this world is getting worse and worse. The devil knows that his time is short. And because of that, he will, he will do more things, which we will discuss this morning. So I just ask that you bow your heads as we pray one more time. Father in heaven, have your Holy Spirit come in this sanctuary and into our hearts. In Jesus' name I ask this. Amen. 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 Our scripture reading from Acts 19. I invite you to go there. Acts chapter 19. And as you are going there, it's just simple questions. How do you feel? Blessed? Do you feel happy that you're here? Yes. Is there anyone that maybe doesn't feel that happy that they're here, but they're here anyway? God bless you. Someone is honest. Good. Well, I mean, you, are, you, you, you are too, but somebody... God bless you for even being here. And as we discuss and we're going to see today, we do things because they're right, not because we feel what we feel. Acts 19, verse 11, and we're going to go this time to verse 14. There it says, Now God worked unusual miracles by the hand of Paul. Notice that it's unusual. It's not common. It's unusual. There's, there's an exception here. So that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick, and the diseases left them, and the evil spirit went out of them. Now talk about power. Paul was so pregnant with power that even his handkerchief, when somebody touched them, what? They got healed. Keep in mind, this is unusual miracles. <clears throat> okay, this is not usually how God works. And then verse 13, Then some of the Jewish exorcists, of the intolerant Jewish exorcists, took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord over those who had evil spirits. Some Bible says to conjure up. Saying, we adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Verse 14. And there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish priest, a Jewish chief priest, who did so. Who did so. There is great power right here in, this, in these verses that we just read so much that even the handkerchiefs are healing people. And my concern and reason for bringing this up, I know that Pastor Powell talked about the Holy Spirit last Sabbath and we're continuing today about receiving the Holy Spirit or feeling the Holy Spirit. But my concern is that we don't get deceived by false manifestations of the Holy Spirit. The devil will do false manifestations in thinking that it is the Holy Spirit. And we need to be able to discern, to discern, to know whether it's from God or whether it's from the Holy Spirit or whether it's from Satan, I'm sorry. We have to be able to discern between the false and the truth. Because you do know for every true thing, the devil has a counterfeit. Doesn't he? Yes. For every truth, there is always a counterfeit. There is a true day that God created the world. And there's a counterfeit that the devil says that this world came into existence. There is a true day that God established and made holy. There is a counterfeit that the devil brings up. There are true manifestations of the Holy Spirit and there are false manifestations of the Holy Spirit. So these sons of Sceva, as it says here in verse 14, and there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish priest who did these things. These were sons of priests. We can call them PKs. 
preacher's kids, they knew, they knew what to do. They were in the church, young adults probably, who grew up in the church, were active in the church, were, in, were new, knew about the ceremonies, knew about the laws. Their father was the chief priest. And the priests were instructed to teach their children. So it wasn't like their children were green and didn't know anything about, about, about God. No, they knew everything that their father knew as well. But how does the Bible describe them? They're in verse 13. As exorcists. That's interesting. You see, they knew also that it was forbidden, totally forbidden, to, to, to do anything with sorcery or magic or, or speaking to the dead, much, much less exorcism and in looking for demons. But although they had, although they were members of the church, we can say, or members there as, as, as children of the priests, although they were part of the pastoral staff maybe, they were in the church, we can see here that they had a double life. They were in the church, but yet what were they practicing? Exorcism. They were involved with, with the, the sorcery, which was totally forbidden. And this is one thing that is keeping the church from really receiving the Holy Spirit, is living, li living a double life living a, a double life. See, many of us may be living a double life and there is an appearance that we give, but then there is a reality. And you can fool me in the appearance, but you cannot fool God in the reality. God knows if we are or if we're not. And these sons of Sceva, they wanted the power to do these miracles, to do these signs and healings but they wanted it without obedience to God. How were they not, not obedient to God? Just by practicing exorcism, by getting involved in sorcery and diabolic thing, diabolical things. They were being disobedient. If we want God's blessings, if we want to receive the Holy Spirit, I can never forget, and even up to this day, our parents would always, would always say, stay away from the devil. Because you give the devil just a little crack like this into your heart, that's all he needs. He'll kick the door wide open. You ex begin to experiment, well, with whatever it may be. Anything that has to do with evilness or wickedness, whether it's a book, a song, or a movie, or a, or a place, anything that has to do with wickedness or evil, stay away from it. We cannot be toying with devilish, evil things and then expect God also to be prospering and blessing and wanting to do miracles in our lives. You see, as we see here, when you read the rest of, of the story, we're not going to read the whole story. We've, I've preached on this story before on, in a different context, but what happens to these sons of Sceva? Do, do any of you already know in advance what happens to them when they try to, to cast out the demons? What do the demons say? What do the demons do? They say, we know Paul and we know Jesus, but who are you? Who are you to tell us what to do? And then what do the, the demons do? They strip them naked and kick them out. God was obviously not with them. They were playing with sorcery. They like they liked the Twilight series. They liked the musical of Wicked and they like all these things and yet they also wanted to do miracles in God's, with God's power. That's not how it works. God is not Santa Claus that at the end of Christmas everybody gets a gift whether you're good or bad. If we want to be saved, we want to be religious, we want the power of God, we have to be willing to stop sinning willfully. They knew better than to be playing with sorcery and exorcism. They knew better. 
They were willingly doing it. If we want God to, to intervene in our lives, we have to be willing to stop sinning in the things that we know are sin. In the things that we know are sin. Because if we are not willing to give it up, to give up sin, we will end up with the false power. With the false power. The devil will give you a thrill, friends, and make you think that you have something. And make you think you, that you have something. But you can pray all day long for the Holy Spirit. You can jump up, sing praises to God. But if you are not willing to give up your sin, your prayers will just bounce off the ceilings. Your praises will just be a show. During prayer meeting, we've been studying the life of David. And, and two characteristics between King David and King Saul that God left Saul, abandoned, God, ab abandoned Saul, rejected Saul, was because Saul wanted to do his own way, play with sorcery. He went to a witch, do his own will, and still wanted the blessings of the prophet. And the prophet many times says, you need to abandon that. Let that go. And David received God's power and God's blessings, although he did sin, a big sin. But the difference is that David recognized his sin, repented his sin, and never did that sin again. He moved away, stepped away. Psalm 66 verse 18 says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Okay, we, 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 we can't be willfully regarding iniquity. 1 John 3, 22. And whatever we ask, we receive from him, comma. Okay, let's not think that we got a, a boarding pass to all the free things now. No. And whatever we ask from him, we receive from him because, here it is, we keep his commandments. We are obedient. And do the things that are pleasing in his sight. And do the things that are pleasing in his sight. So these sons of Sceva were looking for more than just spiritual power. They wanted to have a thrill. They liked, wow, people are being healed just by the handkerchiefs. We want to do that too. Let's try that. They wanted a thrill. They want the experience of some emotional thrill. We, we adjure you. You've seen that on television, haven't you? The, the, the televangelist, in the name of Jesus, come. It's all about a thrill show. And we live in a world, friends, that has become very sensational. And everybody wants to feel something. That's why I ask you, how do you feel today? How do you feel this morning? See, some of us have done foolish things because they felt right. And the devil is an expert at wanting for us to feel good. When he, when he tempted our first parents, he pushed the feeling that it will make you feel good. Just taste it. Just try it. You will be like God's. You will know. They wanted the thrill of miracles. And this is, this is my second point, is that they were associating receiving the Holy Spirit with a thrill. They were associating the Holy Spirit with a thrill, with a feeling, and in their minds to have the Holy Spirit is to have a dramatic experience. It feels cool, that looks cool. We're gonna see in the book of Acts, Turn to Acts chapter 6. As you're going to Acts chapter 6, you know, some people feel that you got to get the drums going to feel good, the clapping rhythm, the raising of the hands, or the high music, or, or even lights, because it makes you feel good in order to receive the Holy Spirit. But let's see what Scripture says, okay? Acts chapter 6. It would be good if I get there. Acts chapter 6, verse 5 and 6. It says, and the same pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. Okay, so Stephen was full of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and, Paul, 
and pro and pro no, I'm sorry and Porcorus Nicanor Timon Perimenas and Nicholas a proselyte from Antioch whom they set before the apostles and when they had prayed they laid their hands on them here we see Stephen full of the Holy Spirit with other disciples of Jesus laying hands to receive the Holy Spirit there's no fuss or shaking here Acts chapter 8 verse 17 Acts chapter 8 verse 17 and we're gonna get back to this story as we close but Acts chapter 8 verse 17 here it says then they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit we don't see no noise here or so much commotion Acts 9 17 and 18 and Ananias this is the story of, of Saul and his conversion and Ananias went his way and entered the house excuse me and laying his hands on him he said brother Saul the Lord Jesus has appeared to you on the road as you came he has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales and he received his sight at once and he arose and was baptized again we see the pouring out of the Holy Spirit was Ananias filled with the Holy Spirit was Ananias filled with the Holy Spirit yes or no <clears throat> he had to have been if he prayed over Saul he, you cannot give what you don't have and so he must have been filled with the Holy Spirit to give Saul to bless Saul and that he may receive his sight again Acts chapter 10 verse 44 Acts chapter 10 verse 44 and 45 it says while Peter was still speaking these words the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word and those of the circumcision who believed were astonished as many as came with Peter because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also but yet we don't see or hear any great commotions or big movements or a thrill there to associate the Holy Spirit do not I'm sorry do not associate the Holy Spirit or the moving of the Holy Spirit with a thrill or with a feeling or with a feeling these are just a couple of verses and the Christian world today has somehow twisted that in making you think or wanting to make us think that in order to receive the Holy Spirit you gotta feel it you gotta you gotta you gotta get in the mood to feel the Holy Spirit and the Christian world today also teaches that you can have power without submission sacredness without sacrifice conversion without commitment redemption without reformation and friends that is not what the Bible says so you can pray all day long and work yourself up for a good feeling but that's all it's gonna be just a good feeling there ain't gonna be no Holy Spirit there you wanna know what the Holy Spirit the, what the Holy Spirit does give go to 1st Corinthians the Bible tells us itself 1st Corinthians chapter 12 1st Corinthians chapter 12 now we're gonna get there is a place and a time for good feelings I'm not completely saying that it's inappropriate but we need to be careful to discern the counterfeits of Satan here in 1st Corinthians chapter 12 verse 7 1st Corinthians chapter 12 verse 7 it says but the manifestations of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all and here they begin to list them for the manifestation of the Spirit isn't that what we're interested in? the manifestation of the Holy Spirit how does the Holy Spirit manifest himself there it is verse 8 for to one it is given the word of wisdom through wisdom Okay, there's no shaking there 
through the, through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge, through the, same, through the same Spirit, to another faith. You don't need a drum beat to have faith, do you? And these are the manifestations of the Spirit. By the same Spirit to another gifts of healings. By the same Spirit to another the works of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, and to another different kinds of tongues. These are the manifestations of the Holy Spirit. Wisdom, knowledge, faith, healing, miracles, prophecy, discernment, speaking in tongues. And it's interesting on how speaking in tongues is last in the list. And there are three places that the gifts of the Spirit are mentioned. And in every time the, the, speak, the gift of speaking in tongues is mentioned last. Now I will, I will in a couple of weeks speak exactly what is the gift of tongues. It is one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And we do believe as Seventh-day Adventists in the gift of speaking in tongues. Amen. But we need to see what the Bible describes what that looks like. What that looks like. And many people, many people in Acts received the Holy Spirit yet they never spoke in tongues. But they were filled with the Holy Spirit. It is one of the gifts of the Spirit. It is not the gift. Just like the Sabbath, the Sabbath is one of the Ten Commandments, isn't it not? It's not the only commandment. So the speaking in tongues is just one of the gifts of the many gifts of the Holy Spirit here. So now I want you to meet somebody there in the book of Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. A man by the name of Simon who followed the thrill. And even joined the church because of the thrill and it felt good. Acts chapter 8 verse 5. Acts chapter 8 verse 5 it says, Then Philip went down to the, the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. So were there signs and miracles that Philip did? Yeah, we see it there. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was a great joy in that city. Amen and amen. amen. People were being delivered from Satan, were being healed. Those are good things. Now notice verse 9. But there was a certain man called what? Simon. Simon. Who previously, what did he practice? Sorcery. Reminds us of the sons of Sceva. Practiced sorcery in the city and astonished the people of Samaria claiming that he was something great. Friends, there will be people in these last days claiming that they are something great. And they will be able to do things just enough maybe for you to begin to, begin to believe in them. And the, and the devil knows that some people need a display. Some people need a show. Some people need a show to believe what they see. To believe and will perform great signs and great wonders. Now notice verse 13. There in Acts 8, verse 13. Then Simon himself also believed. Okay, so he now believed who? Philip and what he was preaching. And when he was what? Baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed seeing the miracles and signs which were done. He joined the church because he was drawn to the sensation, drawn to the thrills. And I, you know, and what, what was he? A sorcerer. So he's used to putting on a show. But now he sees that these guys are doing it in the name of God. And he, and he believes the message. And he is used to entertaining people. So he joins the church and is, and is baptized. But he was drawn by the sensation and not, should have been drawn by what? the preaching of the Word of God, not by what he saw, 
so much, but by what the God, but, but but by what the Bible sees. You cannot get caught up with sensational stuff or with the thrill. <clears throat> when you read the Bible, God shows us that He comes in a small, still voice at times. And God doesn't need noise to save you. You don't have to work it up. You don't have to get your Jesus on to feel the Holy Spirit. No. We need to be submissive to receive the Holy Spirit. We need to just be quiet with our own opinions and submit to Him. And notice verse 18 in this same story. Acts 8, 18. Notice how far he goes. When Simon saw that through, that through the laying on the Spirit apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them what? <laughs> Money. Hey, I want to do that too. How much is it going to cost me? <clears throat> what a slap in the face really for God. Thinking that we can by the power of the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit is not for sale. Amen. The power of the Holy Spirit comes to anyone who submits to Him. Anyone who submits to Him. Now, God can be sensational. God can be sensational. Can you imagine when God created the world how sensational that was? How is going to be again after the millennium when he creates it and we get to see it? That's going to be sensational. Can you imagine crossing through the Red Sea with both the sea on the right and on the left and you crossing on dry ground and God holding the oceans back? That must have been sensational. Or, or even the story of, of Joshua and his men just walking around Jericho not even throwing a stone or maybe just kicking a stone on the ground as you walk and the walls come down. You think that pumped them up and, gave, and they felt sensational that God was with them and gave them victory there? Or how about Peter? We, we studied Peter this, this week in our Sabbath school. You think it was maybe, there must have been some sensation as Peter walked on water. I've never walked on water. But if I would it would be sensational. But we need to be careful that the sensation or the thrill isn't the motivator. Isn't the motivator. In 1 Kings chapter 19, 1 Kings chapter 19, here we see some thrills and some, and some noise and some earthquakes. Turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 19. Elijah is on the run. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 11. It says, Then he said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a, gr and a great and strong wind tore into the mountain and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, what does the Bible say? A still, small voice. A still, small voice. There is a reason why Jesus, when he was here on earth, would wake up early before the sun would come up and seclude alone in a quiet place to communicate with his Father. Because at those quiet moments is when the Holy Spirit talks to us. The Holy Spirit convicts us. God is, is reaching us. That's why Isaiah chapter 30 verse 21 says, Your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, This is the way. Walk in it. So church, don't let your mind get caught up that you need some kind of thrill or worship it needs to feel good. We have entire denominations built on feelings. And sometimes we even have church services built on feelings. They need to feel comfortable, feel good, and so they add the lights, they, they add the fog machines, and I'm not joking. 
because you got to feel good. Normally what comes with a feel good service is a feel good sermon. When we need the straight preaching of the word of God. And if the, word of, and if the preaching of the word of God does not feel good, you need to take it up with God and not with the preacher. If God is bowling over your shoes, then you need to take it up with him. Because he is trying to get a, a point across to you. To point a point across to you. Acts chapter 9 is the story of, of Saul. If you, if you join me there in Acts chapter 9, when Saul was on the road to, to Damascus, <clears throat> he gets knocked off his horse. He is blind. And in, in verse 10, there it says that there was a man named Ananias that God wakes up. And what does God tell him? Hey, go to where Saul is. And it says there in verse 11, So the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas, for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying, and, he is, and in a vision he has seen a, a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hands on him so that he might receive his sight. Ananias knew who he was, especially when the Lord said, Saul of Tarsus. And that's why Ananias says, There, Lord, I have heard many, I have, I have heard many about this man, and how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. Is Ananias feeling good to go there? No. Ananias doesn't even feel good about going there at all. But Ananias is filled with the Holy Spirit. You know why? Because he went and he did what the Lord told him to do. Ananias didn't base his actions on whether it felt good. Because it didn't. Clearly here, he's not, he's not feeling good. But the, the Lord says, I have anointed him, you go. And he goes, and not just goes, but he accepts him by calling him Brother Saul. The Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And they were both filled with the Holy Spirit. Because Ananias just did what the Lord said. Ananias couldn't say, you know, it don't feel good. I don't think so. He would have missed an opportunity of being filled with the Holy Spirit and even filling Saul who God had appointed <clears throat> for the Gentiles there. Galatians chapter 3 re reminds us also Galatians chapter 3 verse 14 on how we receive the Holy Spirit. How we receive the Holy Spirit. Galatians chapter 3 verse 14 it says let the blessing of Abraham might that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through what? Through music, through lights, through action, through faith. Through faith. We need to be careful, friends. We need to be very, very careful that we are not wanting to feel good specifically as our only reason why we come to church. That's why I ask, you know, how do you feel today? Somebody here do doesn't feel good, but they are here. And guess what? They will be filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We shouldn't be looking or seeing, you know, well, who's going to preach? Oh, no. Oh, he makes me feel good. Or this choir makes me feel good it's not about how we feel when we come to church anything else that's fine you want your birthday to feel good great we should feel good on your birthday tomorrow on father's day enjoy happy father's day and feel good but when it comes to god when it comes to god's will we do god's will whether it feels good or it doesn't feel good and so I want to make two appeals to you this morning. 
this afternoon. And the first appeal is for those who may be looking or searching for thrills. And my concern is that some of us are, wanting, are waiting for some special high to receive the Holy Spirit, yet the Spirit will be received heart by heart by heart. Don't expect to go into the building and, and someone says, oh, the Holy Spirit is going to be filled there, and just because you're there, you're going to be filled. The Holy Spirit is filled heart by heart. As each heart opens itself to God, the Holy Spirit fills that heart. The Holy Spirit fills that heart. See, I want the real thing. I don't want some conjured up thing. I don't want to work it up to feel it. No, I want the real thing. Sometimes I have found that we need to follow God and do His will even when it doesn't feel right even when it doesn't feel good. We do what God says. I want something that I have found through a deep relationship with Jesus. And if you get something based on emotion, when the emotion fades, guess what? You lose what you came for. That's why you should never marry someone based on emotion. Amen. I, no one thinks so. Amen. Because when the emotion leaves, do you leave too? I, <laughs> love, you marry someone based on a principle. Based on principle. So that when you feel like, man, I shouldn't be married, you still stick around. On principle, on love. Regardless of what it feels. Because feelings are like this. Right? Sometimes we're up in cloud nine. And then sometimes, oh, I cannot see you today. <laughs> I'm not talking about me. <laughs> but every person, couple here who's been married long enough, you have up and down feelings. Sure, you have fights, you have arguments, but you stick around because it's not based on feelings, but it's based on a principle. Is based on a principle. You see, people who serve God based on their feelings, they get upset when they lose their loved ones. Or they turn around when they lose their job. Or they may get upset when their car goes bad. Why? Because their relationship is based on a feeling. Their relationship with God is based on a feeling and it should not be based on a feeling. God can make you feel good. Yes, He can. But that is not primarily the reason why I serve him. Amen. And so I just appeal to every single one of us here who may be a thrill seeker. You know, I want to go to, to this service or I like this music because it makes me feel good or that sermon makes, makes me feel good or that preacher makes me feel good. I just appeal, friends, as the days are winding up for Jesus to come. Not everything is going to feel good. Are you going to stick around for Jesus? Or are you going to leave because now it's become uncomfortable and the, the feeling is not good? My second appeal is for those who have been coming to this church. You believe what the Bible says. You believe what the Seventh-day Adventists teach that what the Bible says. You even have friends here in this church. But yet something has kept you from becoming a member because it may not feel right. I want to appeal to you today that you don't base your decision on membership whether it feels right Is what the Bible says true? If, is it what we believe as a church true? Then what is keeping you from becoming a member of God's church? If, if you've seen and you believe it and everything, but it may not feel right 
friends, when Jesus comes, you're going to feel something. And it's not going to be heaven. The Bible calls it the weeping and gnashing of teeth. Because it didn't feel right. I believe it, but I, don't forget, Jesus is coming for his bride. He's coming for his church. He's coming for his church. So I want to appeal to those. Maybe you've been coming here for a while and you haven't become a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I want to appeal. What is keeping you? There are cards right here. I'm not going to ask you to come to the front. There are cards in the pews just like this. Just give me your contact information. You can either give it to the elder standing on this side at the end when we leave or myself standing on this side at the end. You've been coming here for a while but yet you have not made that decision because maybe it doesn't feel right and now God is telling you forget what you feel. If you know what the Bible says and it is true, what is keeping you to becoming a member of His church? It's not my church, it's His church. It's God's church. And I want to praise God because if Jesus had yielded to follow his feelings in Gethsemane, we wouldn't have a plan of salvation. We studied Jesus in, in Gethsemane this week. Amen? Yes. We did. If you study your Sabbath school lesson and praise the Lord that Jesus, did he feel like dying? Did he feel like being stabbed? No. He even said, Lord, if there's another way, I don't feel like going through it. If there is another way, I don't want to go through this. I don't feel like getting nailed in my feet, in my hands. I don't feel like getting whipped 39 times. I don't feel like getting a spear in my side. But praise God that he did not base his decision on how he felt. Amen. Amen. What did he say? Nevertheless, Lord, let your will be done. Let your will be done. And because of that, we have eternal life and a plan of salvation. Amen and amen. So Jesus did not base his decision on his feelings. And so I want to appeal to you today to not base your decision on your feelings. Base it on the knowledge of what you know about God. If you've seen that this church is teaching what the Bible says, then join the church. If you see that this church has error, then come tell me. Because I want to be following in the right path. And if I'm in the wrong path, I want to be in the right path. I want to be in the right path. So I just appeal to you today, church. Do not let your feeling determine whether you go to church or not, or whether you go to prayer meeting or not, or whether you participate next week in communion service. Amen and amen. amen. It would be a miracle of God if the people I see today come next week. Amen. amen. The best time to get closer to God is at communion service. Yeah. It's the best time. We can get, of course, every day, of course, every day. But what a better time when we partake in the emblems that represent Him. And we take His blood and accept His forgiveness and take His body that was broken for us. And we start afresh and He forgives us afresh and start a new walk with Him. So I just appeal to you. If you may feel that the devil is telling you you don't deserve to go next week, it's not worth it, go rebuke the devil. The, Jesus says rebuke the devil and he will flee. Yes. Feeling is an emotion that God gave us. Yes, it is. And I praise the Lord for it. There are many things that make me feel good. But when it comes to my relationship with Jesus, when it comes to my church, my feelings have to be put aside and I have to follow the word of God. Follow the word of God. 
Jesus says that man shall live by, not by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And we do not, for we follow, for we believe by faith and not by sight. Not by what we feel, but by faith. So again, church, God bless you. God bless you. And spend more time with God. As the days are getting closer to His coming, our feelings may draw us one way, but we need to stay straight in the narrow way. Not leaning toward the left, not leaning toward the right. Fixed our eyes on Jesus. And just as Jesus didn't follow his feelings, praise the Lord. He followed through God's, through his Father's will. I appeal to you, follow through God's will. Amen? Amen. May God bless you this morning. Father in heaven, Lord, you are so good to us. Forgive us if sometimes we've made decisions based on our feelings that have gone contrary to your word. Lord, but thank you also because you are just and faithful to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank you. And so, Lord, I just want to ask and appeal that we may not serve you based on our feelings or determine where we serve or, or, or worship based on our feelings. But because we know that you are true, you are loving and you're good. And if there is anyone here who maybe has put off becoming a member of this church because based on their feelings, Lord, I just ask you, O oh God in heaven, that you intervene in their lives right now and that you make them uncomfortable that they have to pick up that card. Lord, I thank you for your Holy Spirit who is still working today. And help us to be able to discern the true manifestations of your Spirit and the false manifestations of your Spirit. We don't need to get worked up. We don't need so many attractions or thrills we just need to spend time in your word in a quiet place to listen to your spirit thank you Lord because you hear my prayers and thank you because you hear the prayers of your people here bless us on this Sabbath day in the name of Jesus I pray Amen